The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. Next on Life Today, Sheila Walsh identifies the keys to powerful prayer. I don't think you can get to the place of surrender until you've come through the, the doorway of honesty. You know, you might be facing something right now that you think, God, if you loved me, why did you let this happen? So what I want to encourage you to do is, you know, so often we think we're supposed to say the right thing to God. No, you come as you are. Hi, welcome to Life Today. I'm Sheila Walsh, and I'm so happy to be with you. You know, I've talked to you in previous shows about the power of prayer, but I really want, I want to revisit that today because I can't think of anything more important. Prayer sustains us in the best days of our lives and in the worst. When I wrote my book, um, I brought a copy with me today, Praying Women, I honestly, I didn't actually write it to be something that would be published. When I looked at my own life, I thought, you know, I, I love studying the Word of God. It's like my hobby. I love diving deep into like the original Hebrew or the Greek and just, you know, finding the wealth that's in God's Word. I love teaching, you know, and I love doing this. But I thought, you know, I asked the Holy Spirit, which is the weakest area in my life? And it, I really felt that the Lord said, the weakest area of your life, Sheila, is prayer. So I began this project, not because I wanted to put it out as a book, I wanted to understand more about prayer and the power of prayer. But I began to see that I wasn't the only one who struggled with prayer at times. So sometimes when I'm doing research on a subject, I'll throw a question out on Facebook. And by the way, if you don't follow me on Facebook, my, it's Sheila Walsh Connects. And I'll often do, I'll often go live, you know, in the evenings, maybe just try and share a word of encouragement or Sunday's Barry, my husband joins me and Sunday's the dogs join me too. So you never know. But I threw out this question on Facebook and I said, when I say the word prayer, what comes to your mind? And I said, now don't say what you think you're supposed to say. Say what honestly comes to your mind. And there were so many responses in just the first hour. So see if you can relate to any of these. Um, quite a few people said, I get bored. I thought, well, that's pretty honest. And a lot of people said, I get distracted. You know, I'm praying and I'm suddenly thinking, oh, did I defrost the chicken? You know, um, I get that too. But then some of them weighed more, you know. One woman said, God already knows what he's doing, so why, why bother pray? And the one that I think um, hurt my heart the most was a woman who said, you know, I prayed that God would spare the life of my child and he didn't. So I don't even want to talk to God anymore. And that, I mean, I spent a lot of time that night praying for that woman and privately messaging her and trying to help her process her grief, but in the presence of God, not outside of the presence of God. So if prayer with the word of God is the greatest resource of the believer, why is it then that more often than not, it's the most underused weapon we have? Now, just stop for a moment and think, why do you think that is? You know, I think as human beings, we want to think that we're doing something. And in prayer, we don't always feel as if we're doing something. But that is a lie of the enemy that he would love us to keep on believing. So today I thought I would give you just a few keys to a powerful, doable daily prayer life. So... Number one, start where you are. Sounds pretty simple, but I'm serious. Start where you are right now. John Bunyan wrote in prayer, it's better to have a heart with no words than words with no heart. You know, prayer activates the power of God. And maybe you think, well, you don't understand. I'm not good at, I'm not good at public speaking. I'm not good at, I can't imagine talking out loud to God. I, I'm just, I'm not good at prayer. But you know, the interesting thing that I discovered at the darkest time in my life was one of the most profound lessons I ever learned about prayer. You know, I've shared with you in previous programs that 
Some time ago, I was hospitalized for clinical depression. And by that point, I had been in seminary. I had worked in Youth for Christ for years. I'd worked with Dr. Billy Graham and his crusades. I'd co-hosted the 700 Club with Pat Robertson for five years. So I was used to being able to, to pray, you know, loud prayers, quiet prayers, prayers on my face, you know, praying for other people. But that night, when I ended up in the hospital, I had no words left. And I just, I have this profound memory of laying on the floor of my room in the psych hospital, and the only words I could squeeze out were these, help me. I, I had nothing great left to say. It was simply, help me. But I have to tell you, I felt the Lord's presence more in those two broken, wept through words than in so many of the mighty prayers I maybe have prayed before. So if you're in a place right now where you just don't even know how to pray, or maybe you're in a situation where you think, you know what, I don't even know if God's listening to me. I don't know if my words go any higher than the ceiling. I just want to invite you into the vulnerability of that prayer. Help me. In fact, one of the stories in scripture that illustrates that, if you, if you look at Ma Matthew chapter 14, that's when we remember that story of the disciples on a boat at night and Jesus had gone up into the mountains by himself to pray. And, you know, he can see where they are and there's a storm blowing up. I mean, it's really wild. And Christ comes walking to them across the waves. Now, when they first saw Jesus, they assumed it was a ghost. There was a belief back then that ghosts and evil spirits lived in the water. So when they see a person walking on the water, they assume it's a ghost. But then Peter, you know, cries out and, and realizes that it's the Lord. And he said, Lord, invite me. Would you ask me to come out and join you? So Jesus says to him, come on. So with all the other disciples looking on, wondering what on earth is going to happen, Peter steps out of the boat onto the waves and is, he's held up. And he walks towards Jesus. But the minute he takes his eyes off the Lord, he begins to sink. You know, once he starts to look at all the, the waves and the wind around him. But do you remember what Peter's prayer was in Matthew 14? Two words. Save me. Save me, Lord. And the Lord reached out and grabbed hold of Peter. So start where you are. You don't have to come up with fancy words. God is not looking for fancy words. He's looking for your heart. So that's number one. Number two, pray and don't give up. Pray and do not quit. One of my favorite stories on prayer, you'll find it in Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. And it's one of the most powerful stories that Jesus told about never, ever giving up in prayer. You know, when you hear me say, don't give up, you might think, well, that's fine for you. Your life's not as busy as mine. But this is straight from Jesus. This is what we read in verse one. One day, Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. It doesn't get much clearer than that. And the story is all about this. You might remember, we call her the relentless widow, I think. She keeps coming to a judge asking for justice. And he's the kind of judge that doesn't care about God. He doesn't care about the people who are looking to him. I would imagine if you want any kind of justice from this man, there's probably going to have to be some money change hands. But she will not give up. So he walks out of his house in the morning and there she is. Um, he goes for lunch and there she is. Wherever he goes, there she is and she will not quit. And in the parable that Jesus says, eventually, because she won't stop, he finally grants her what she asked for, not because he cares about her, but just because she won't go away. And Jesus goes on then to teach about, don't you think God, your father, who loves you so much, will be, will be eager to answer. But I think sometimes there's something that God looks for in us. How committed are we to praying? And maybe you've prayed about something for a while and you think, well, God's not answering, so I may as well, I may as well quit. I want to encourage you 
in the name of the Lord, don't give up. Keep praying, keep praying, keep asking, keep knocking, keep seeking. But this is, the third thing is something that I've been thinking about a lot recently. It's this, pray hardest when it's hardest to pray. Pray hardest when it's hardest to pray. There are some situations where prayer can just feel impossible, when the situation is overwhelming. You know, every morning before I leave the house, I always ask, Lord, if there's anybody um, today that you want me to talk to, give me eyes to see them so I don't miss them. So I was uh, getting coffee and when I came out, there was a woman sitting on the sidewalk outside the coffee shop. And I sat down a little distance from her and, and I said to her, are you okay? Because she looked, she looked burdened down and it also was strange to see a woman of, you know, she was about the same age as me, just sitting on the sidewalk. And she turned to me and she said, um, I just discovered that I have cancer. And I said to her, you know, would you mind if I prayed for you? And her eyes filled with tears and she said, I haven't prayed in years. And I said, well, if you don't mind, I would be honored to pray for you. And so I, I prayed for her. We prayed together for a while. And she said, is this something that God cares about? And I said, I promise you this is something God cares about. But just thinking, I was just thinking of some of the recent letters or sometimes private messages that I get on Facebook. And it's situations that seem so hard to pray about after a while. You know, my son is on drugs again. I don't know where he is tonight. I got a letter from a woman in Ireland and she said, my husband was caught embezzling money from our church and now he's going to prison. How do I, how do I pray about that? Um, a letter from another woman, she said, I had an affair and now I'm pregnant. I mean, I've destroyed all our lives. Now, I don't know what you might be facing at the moment. But what I wanna ask is how do you pray when the situation that you're facing is just overwhelming. Whenever I've found myself in a situation where I don't know what to do, I always turn to Mark 14, because in Mark 14, we turn to Jesus and we are given a front row seat to how Christ prayed on the most devastating night of his life. You know, you remember, where you know, he went with the 11 disciples, Judas had already gone off to betray him. And he asked Peter, James and John, his three closest friends, you know, to, to come further down into the garden with him. He knew that on that night he would be betrayed. He knew that he would go through a mockery of a trial and he knew that he would be brutally executed. And his prayer in the garden is one of the most, it feels like holy ground to me that we're allowed to see how Christ prayed. But it's so interesting because there's two parts to it. There's, there's honesty in his humanity. He wants this cup to pass from him. Father, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. But then we come to this beautiful surrender, but not my will, your will be done. Here's what I think. I don't think you can get to the place of surrender until you've come through the, the doorway of honesty. You know, you might be facing something right now that you think, God, if you loved me, why did you let this happen? So what I want to encourage you to do is, if so often we think we're supposed to say the right thing to God, no, you come as you are. If you're angry, then you tell your God you're angry. If you're disappointed, if you're hurting, if you're broken, lay it all out. Pour out your pain. Pour it out on the Lord. And what you'll discover is you've made more space for grace. And then you're able to say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Which brings me to the fourth thing. Pray through your pain. Something that I believe at this stage in my life is where your wounds are, there lies your authority. When you have walked through something with Christ and he has brought you through, you have an authority you didn't have before. You know, I have a, 
one of those kind of garden stones, you know, that people can make and put all sorts of patterns on. I have one in our backyard. Um, if you ever come over, I'll show it to you. But it was made by my son, and it's got all sorts of little pieces of glass and pottery. And, and then he wrote in the middle before the cement hardened, I love you, Mom. And I have it there for the obvious reason. You know, I, I love my son, and I treasure that. But the other reason I have it there is I go out every morning with my coffee and I look at it and it's a daily reminder to me of a profound spiritual truth. It's a beautiful thing that God will do with a broken life if you give him all the pieces. You know, maybe you think your life's not as pretty as it used to be, but if you will give God all the brokenness, he will make something beautiful with it. My friend Darlene Check and I were in, oh gosh, I can't remember the state. I think it was um, maybe North Carolina. We were both speaking at a women's conference there, it was about 5,000 women. And Darlene had just walked through a two year journey with breast cancer that had been pretty rough. And as she spoke that night, and I've always loved her, you might know her from the worship song she wrote um, called Shout to the Lord um, years ago, but she is a powerful teacher. And that night, she paused halfway through her message and she asked the women in the audience, how many of you, this is part of your story too. If you are walking through breast cancer, if you're on the other side of it, you know, I want to ask you, will you stand? Well, it was, it was mind blowing to me as all these women around the arena stood and she prayed for them. And boy, did she pray for them. Because see, here's the thing. When you've walked through a tough battle, but you've walked through it with the Lord and you come through the other side, you have an authority. And as she prayed, I saw that she, you become a mighty warrior in love's army when you bring all of your pain to the Lord. Prayer is so life changing. And you know, it might, not always change the heart of God. We see some situations where like Moses said, hey, you know, please forgive the people. Please, I beg you, and God changed his mind. But what I've discovered most about prayer is it changes me. In fact, have you ever read the book by C.S. Lewis called The Screwtape Letters? It's letters, it's kind of a interesting way of writing. A senior devil writing to his nephew, Wormwood. Screwtap is, is the uncle. And he's trying to talk to him about one of the most devastating things that can happen is when a believer finds out that God's not responding the way that they thought he would and still trusts him anyway. And I guess that's point number five. Pray when heaven seems silent. This is what this devil writes. And when he refers to our enemy, he's talking about our God. And this is what he says to his nephew. Our cause is never more in danger than when a human no longer desiring, but still intended to do our enemies, God's will, looks around upon a universe from which every trace of him seems to have vanished and asks why he's been forsaken and still obeys. Do you know what that does? Can you imagine the celebration that goes on in heaven? The awe that the angels have, that even though you're not getting all your prayers answered the way you wished, you still get down on your knees and you still worship. Let's be those who are fervent in our prayer. We start, we come as we are, we're fervent in our prayer. And even when heaven seems silent, we say, God, I don't understand everything but I trust you and I worship you and we silence the enemy. That's powerful. And now I wanna show you something powerful that you and I can do together. Watch this. It's been one of the most unique years in living memory and it's not even over. But you have helped us hold firm in our commitment to share God's love in word and deed. Because you chose to love the overlooked, thirsty villages who lacked safe drinking water are now blessed with clean water wells. Because you chose to value the sanctity of life, hungry children have been saved from starvation through your gift of a daily bowl of food. And when we minister to the body, the door is open for us to minister to the soul. 
Heavenly Father, we know you love Sadawat. We know he's created by you with your hands. And we place them in your hands today. This upcoming Christmas, we want to give special attention to souls of a different kind, the souls of precious children's feet, because good health starts from the ground up. Some of these feet are so torn up, they're just bruised and scarred. These are what unprotected feet look like. In developing countries especially, bare feet easily become infected and are deadly targets for hookworm, which threaten their very lives. Some children have never owned a pair of shoes, so this is a happy day for these little guys. It's a happy day for us, because we get to put them on their little precious feet. This coming Christmas, we need your help to remind children like these that their lives have value. By protecting their health with a special gift they'll never forget, help us give the gift of Christmas shoes. Oh, I cannot tell you how many ways I love that. You know, it's been such a challenging year for everybody. You know, people have lost their jobs, they've lost a lot of finances, they've, they've lost their health, some have even lost their lives. And you know, I think the enemy would love nothing more than if we say, 2020, we just want to be done with you. But I want to come up with a challenge. Why don't we determine, you know what, 2020, you came in really, really rough, but we're going to end up in a celebration because we, as the body of Christ, are going to rise up and give out of our nothing, give out of our lack and make a difference. And every single one of us can do that. You might be saying, well, why are you coming to us so early with a Christmas appeal? It's simply because we've made a commitment that we want to provide 150,000 pairs of shoes to children who have probably never had a pair of shoes in their life. And you saw the feet on those darling wee ones that, you know, they get so torn up and they get all sorts of diseases. This is one of our, my favorite appeals because we can all do something. Do you know that for $36, you provide 10 pairs of shoes? You can't pay, buy one pair of shoes basically for $36 anymore, but 10 pairs of shoes, $72, 20 pairs of shoes. If you can do $180, 50 pairs of shoes. And if you're thinking, well, it's a little hard at the moment to come up with that, um, let me tell you one of the things that I've done. There's sites where you can take your shoes, because I have too many shoes. So I put them on a couple of those sites and I've sold a couple of pairs. I sold a couple of pairs and made enough to provide 20 pairs of Christmas shoes. So let's be creative this year. Let's come up with new ways to go above and beyond. You know, I think our, the enemy would love, I mean, remember, we don't just fight our earthly battles. We don't just fight viruses. We are in a spiritual battle. And so I think this, there's never been a greater Christmas for the body of Christ to say, you know what? We are not going to lie down. We're going to stand up in Jesus' name and we're going to make a difference. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could provide shoes for 300,000 children? I'm going to whisper that in case James and Betty hear, but they would say a big loud amen. I can tell you that. So please, will you go to your phone and make the very best gift possible? Now remember, we also, it's called Christmas Shoes and Smiles. For $500, you can provide corrective surgery to a child born with cleft lip or cleft palate. But let's every single one of us do something. And for any gift at all, you'll get this darling little shoe. This year it's a cobalt blue crystal. And if you can do $1,000, you can provide shoes for 275 children or two surgeries. So please, Go to your phone, make the very best gift possible. Let's end this year in a triumphant note because of Jesus. Poverty is a killer, and because of it, children needlessly suffer, not only from a lack of food and clean water, but also from a lack of things we often take for granted, like a simple pair of shoes. Far too many children living in extreme poverty have never owned a new pair of shoes. And while that may seem minor in light of all their needs, walking with bare feet puts them at risk of life-threatening infections and disease that could lead to crippling consequences and even death. By responding today, you will help secure and make ready 150,000 Christmas shoes to be shipped and delivered to children around the world just in time for the holidays. Your gift of $36 will help provide 10 pairs of shoes 
A gift of $72 will help provide 20 pairs, and a gift of $180 will help provide 50 pairs of Christmas shoes for children in need. As a thank you for your gift of support, be sure to request this beautifully crafted blue crystal shoe ornament, a treasure to display at each Christmas. With your gift of $100 or more, you may also request this keepsake boxed set of all life's Christmas shoe ornaments. Finally, please consider a gift of $1,000 or more to help provide 275 pairs of shoes or two children with corrective cleft lip or palate surgeries, and you may request the beautiful A Mother's Strength Bronze Sculpture. Please call, write, or make your gift online today. I gotta tell you what a happy day this is for me. You know, I'm, I'm here with 20 kids who've all received shoes today because someone like you was generous enough to say, I'll give $72, or maybe two of you gave $36. And that gift of $36 meant that 10 or $72 meant that 20 children got shoes here today. Please, do it today. Get online or dial that number on your screen and give. Give a gift, an extra special, above normal gift that is the gift of shoes, the gift of joy. What that would mean is you would extend this line just that much further. You would extend the expression of God's heart and His hands to these children and you would extend the joy in villages just like this by giving these children the precious gift of a pair of shoes. Isn't this a joy to do this? I'm so excited about this. And if you would like my book called Praying Women, you can request that for any gift at all. We'll also be happy to send you this darling little shoe. And, but I know you don't do it for that, but it's just, and it's also a great reminder when you see those shoes that we have, different ones each year, sparkling in your Christmas tree, it's a reminder to pray for those children. So I just, I feel this surge of hope in the midst of a difficult year that we're gonna be able to make a difference. Provide those surgeries, provide those shoes and what a joy it'll be as we celebrate the birth of our Savior to know that we're able to impact other people's lives. So I'll see you next time. This is Sheila Walsh saying goodbye. God bless you. Jesus died not to give us the ability to cope, but to conquer. <laughs> Jimmy Evans explains the overcoming life tomorrow. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.